uh, please give him a warm welcome. Well, hello. Um, as as uh, Roy said, I'm I'm John Ledrew. I, I've been a in kind of working in the software engineering space, doing a lot of different things for coming up to about 20 years now. And I've worn a lot of different hats. So uh, software engineer, team lead, tech lead, architect, development manager, tester, business analyst, product manager, project manager, and also occasionally a product owner. So before we begin, I want to give, uh, could, could I ask all of the the product owners to stand up. So people who are in product ownership, perhaps BAs. Oh, is there really? Oh, good. I was hoping there wouldn't just be one because I've got a present for you. So if I could just give you that, and could I ask you to pop that sticker on? Uh, so uh, just pass that along, just down there. Just, just we want to make sure we know know who you all are and you know who you are. Uh, it's important. There we go. Uh, so if you just. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I've got someone else come out. You didn't want to miss out I on the sticker. Really you know, you might regret it now. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so for those that didn't see it, that just says I'm the last ringable neck. Um, I think everyone that's a product owner knows what that feels like. You can sit down now. We will, we will address that later. But I just wanted to make sure you all kind of uh, know, uh, you know, know where you stand uh, for the beginning. So. I'd like to have you uh, have a bit of a conversation with you to begin with. So can I first ask anyone, just think of a time when you've worked on a project with a product owner. I imagine this is a relatively common thing, and most of you will have something in mind, being the group that we're in. Um, could anyone tell me a little bit? You don't need to give details. Does anyone want to give us one little snippet of what they're doing, a project they're working on? as a product owner. I know there's a few product owners here, so anyone will say what they're doing. Don't need to give me details, and I'm not asking for IP. I mean, if you want to do that, I, you can give it me in person, and we can deal with that separately. Anyway, what, so what's somebody doing on your project? Yeah. It's not what I'm doing now. No? Um, I was building a website that had no relevance to anything, but it's really <laughs> important that we got it out. Oh, wow, that's a good one. <laughs> and was that with a product owner that was asserting how important yeah, it was? So if, he, if we didn't get it out within like, the two-week frame, uh, timeline. He was going to get um, but uh, things bad. So, so, oh, so he was going to have he was going to have his 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 bum abused by someone else, and I assume he was going to pass on that abuse down the chain in a I, I in an appropriate way. Well, no. I'll say there was a lot of. Well, that was nice. You were showing a lot of empathy to the yeah. product owner. That that's good. <laughs> From our last talk, that's awesome. You know. Um, OK, well, that, that's fine. So how, uh, well, that's an interesting, I think this could be quite uh, uncomfortable. So how did it, how, how did it feel? Um, can anyone talk about another experience? I imagine some of you were thinking about that. How did it feel to be? <laughs> no, no, you haven't, but um, that's quite a relevant question after that. How did it feel to be a product owner? How, well, can anyone suppose how that product owner felt? <laughs> I imagine so, yeah. How do, how do you think it felt? What, what do you think was the main thing driving that product owner? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. Yeah, that's absolutely right. What, what do you think? Who, are there any, any people in here? Yeah, go on. I don't fear. I don't you don't have any fear? No. no. no I don't, I'm not I don't fear. <laughs> no, that's fine. I mean, you should, obviously. <laughs> you shouldn't be a product owner if you can't tell the stakeholders. Three things: there's quality, there's scope, or there's. Uh, you know. <laughs> 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 what do we need to skip? Who? <laughs> Those things. Yeah, you should. <laughs> 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 right, <all right. laughs> so, um, so what? I've just given you all some stickers. So, who who here agrees that the product owner is the last ringable neck? Because obviously, the guy that created the the job created that that job title does think that it is the last ring of all neck. That that came straight from Master Sutherland, that that phrase. I don't agree with him, but I'd say we were accountable. Pardon? I'd say we were the accountable ones. If the dev team mess up then So then you are the last ring of all neck then. <laughs> Hopefully no literal neck ringing, but I mean it depends on the organization. We're not accountable for delivering. We're not accountable for delivering something. We're accountable to get get our products done. Okay. <laughs> so, 
All right, let's, let's ask another question. You, you gave an example of a product owner, so I'm just going to pick on you. Um, how, how did the product owner's behavior affect the rest of the team? Yeah, they did sack half of them, but um, <laughs> <laughs> they're really good ones. <laughs> I mean, his, his behavior meant that we were awake at a lot of times we shouldn't have been because we were trying to protect him. Okay. But, and so, yeah, he, he kind of made it. So it wasn't sustainable like, because of his fear. Kind of it's thing. quite lucky because in your context, you actually cared about him or them. There are many situations where there are product owners that are driven by fear, where the team really don't care about the product owner at all, uh, I, I would say. Um, so in a way, the fact that you had some empathy for them was quite nice <laughs> for them, I imagine, regardless of the painful potential uh, you know, sexual uh, related <laughs> problems that he was going to experience as a result of a lack of delivery. All right, so let's, um, after that little diversion, let's... Uh, <laughs> Let, let's talk about, can anyone give me one word that describes for them what a great product owner is? Go on. What's knowledgeable. Knowledgeable, okay. Another one. Engaged. Engaged. Any Honest. others? What? Honest. Honest, okay. Reliable. Reliable, did you say? Available, Available. yeah, that's a yeah. good one. That's a very good one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Present. Sorry, go on. Realistic. Realistic. Empowered. empowered. Explain empowered. Uh, so a lot of product owners I've worked with actually don't have any power to make any decisions because they okay. kind of go, oh, we think we should do that, and then they run off to the stakeholders, and then they come back and say, no, that was a terrible decision. So, so they are representing the stakeholders, aren't they? They are meant to be, a, in some cases, a proxy for the, for the customer. So are they still meant to be... a lot of the time, they just seem to run back and forth between the two opposing camps. So if it's just them acting as a shield, so you've got a manager over here that can't be bothered talking to the team over here, and they're just a messenger, basically. Is that yes. what you're saying? Yeah, okay. that's quite often. So there's no, and it's not really a dialogue because it's just messages going sure. between the two camps. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've, I've, so that beginning, that beginning of the section is normally quite a bit longer, <laughs> um, but I've trimmed it down on account of our time. So let's let's just. So we've just spoken about that. Can anyone think of? A product owner, we've had, let me just go through some of those words. We had reliable, available, um, um, was it empowered, uh, knowledgeable. Can anyone think of a product owner they've worked with that genuinely had all of those traits? Like, a genuinely, they work with a product owner they can think of that was just brilliant. I imagine all of the you, is it? <laughs> could you, could you? No. <laughs> Where, are you willing to discuss uh, maybe something about the project that? that uh, yeah. So, I, w without a shadow of a doubt, the, um, the the best people to work with are the people that, who are very directly connected to the money they're spending. So that you know, uh, so of all the clients that we've got, the, it's the smallest businesses uh, that are the most pleasurable to work with. That have a, obviously, um, uh, you know, um, they're being led typically by people who are very. Uh, appreciate it yeah. you know they appreciate the money they're spending and spend it very carefully and wisely and that makes it a joy to for them to work with so when they're in a way you're talking about the empowered people because they're the ones that so they're super empowered they're yeah. su you know their eyes are you know out on stalks when yeah. they're making these decisions because they're they're um it's crucial their judgment is crucial yeah so in the way that the most important thing is is it that is that would, would people agree that the disempowered product owners, the product owners that are just these messengers. The problem with that is actually that affects every other, all of the other things that we need them to be because their availability isn't there because when you need them to make a decision quickly, they can't actually make a decision because they have to go and check it with someone else. So you, in some respects, that power or that autonomy on the front, on the part of that product owner, would, would people agree that could be a pretty critical part of this? Who, so have, have, has everyone, how many people in the room, uh, I'm assuming, just put your hand up if you've once worked on a project with a product owner before. I imagine most of you have. So leave your hand up in the air if you think that um, that product owner, that, or one of the product owners that you may have worked with, I assume more than one in some cases, actually had the autonomy, the decision-making autonomy that they needed to do their job properly. Aim, isn't it? So that was... <laughs> and, and how many of those people were also available all the time when you needed them. They had the knowledge as well. So they're, oh, okay. Oh, gosh, okay. So some of them had a lot of autonomy, but not the knowledge 
to, oh, that's, that's a, from a, I, I see us falling into disorder. <laughs> okay, so I have another question for you. This is a, a fun question. Where does the work come from? You're working, you're a developer on a team. You have work to do each day, whether they're index cards that are going up on the wall or their wall was significantly uh, more echoey and wobbly than I expected it to be when I hit it. Um, the, uh, so you've got, you've got pieces of work, stuff that comes in, people want you to do stuff. Where does that work come from? Customers? How did that? Stakeholders? Always? Does, is, that, is that always where it comes from? Is everything you do? Yeah, it comes from the team. Yeah. So how do how does the so first we had the customer. I think that's probably the, 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 the easiest one to answer this next question. How does the customer know what work to do? How do they know what is the right thing to do? Yeah? Yeah, they've got problems. Yeah. So that so actually the customer in this in this situation, they're quite good at knowing what they want. You know, that, that's quite a good thing. Um, what about the managers or the stakeholders? I guess in most cases, would people agree that they are? So go on. I'm just going back to what you said. Yeah. Sometimes you have the problem: the customer knows what they want, but the uh, solution they need to the solution rather than yeah. trusting the team to come up with. What I mean by that is, is at the end of the day, the customer is the only person that genuinely can absolutely say, you have delivered what I wanted you to deliver. There isn't really anyone else that definitively knows that, that you've delivered. You, I, I think it's questionable whether or not you can say, sure, customers struggle to communicate what they want, <laughs> and they certainly struggle to understand their needs and understand those things. But re at the end of the day, when you give them something, they will know whether they've received what they expected, regardless of whether they're able to communicate it to you. Um, what about the stakeholders? So stakeholders certainly in my experience, are generally people that work for an organization of some kind, and they are um, often not the end customer in a lot of cases. They sometimes are the end customer. In that case, I think they fall into the customer category. In stakeholders, how do stakeholders know what the right thing to do is? They don't. Is that, is that right? They just don't? How many? Sorry. <laughs> You'd hope. <laughs> I like how you said hope. <laughs> well, you know, I'm sure if you ask them for like the cost, well, actually, I'd want to know that I can ask them for the cost and see, like, you know, this is how much money we're At, at this point, the costs are not necessarily relevant. It's more about knowing that what they are about, they've suggested, you know, changing that, that button from red to blue. Is that actually going to be the right thing to do for whatever their goals are? So is that is that they, they'll, there'll be some organizational goal for making a change to a piece of software. That's normally, uh, you know, making a bit more money. We think that revenue might go up, for example. How do they know? How do you know that that thing is actually going to change? And is that... Pardon? So experimentation. Okay, we'll come on to that. <laughs> so... The bottom line is you never do. All you can do is do as little as you possibly can and then use metrics to decide what so, you Okay, out of interest then, um, how many people here work on teams that are driven by user experience testing in some way? So we have, I'm going to guess, so would anyone estimate, my estimate that there is maybe 50 people in the room, perhaps, maybe a bit more, 40 maybe? I count, what, five hands, I think? So we're talking about just over 10%, okay, of people are actually doing user experience testing to verify, which is actually the only way that you'd have some degree of uh, understanding. So out of those, the people that aren't doing that testing, sorry, go on. We do it, but we're not yeah. doing it. Oh, well, that's, okay. So sure, but it's still, if you're not really using it to drive your decision making, then your decisions are being driven by something else. Yeah, so then for the 90 all right, so for the, the 89%, I will, I will hope, I'll give you a half point. <laughs> for the 89% or the 89 and a, uh, 79 and a half percent of the room that are not driven by that, how is that decision being made? How do they know what they're doing? Is it just a guess? Mainly. I mean, I'm being deliberate. Well, as a, as a, as a product development team, you're implicitly a kind of a, a user yourself. Yeah, yeah. Could be. That's a good... That's a good point, yeah. But as far as the typical way where the requirements are being uh, 
are coming from other places, stakeholders, for example, business people. They're dictated from outside of the team a lot of the time, certainly the user needs. If those needs are not being researched in the first place, how do they know them? So yeah, copying the competition is the most common answer I get here when I push people or when they go, we can't possibly be doing things just by guessing. No, no, we don't guess, we copy the other people. <laughs> and they go, yeah, that's much better, Thank, well done. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely, copying the other people because it's always good to be slightly behind the competition. That's, that's always the, uh, the business goal that you want, obviously. So do you, do you think we're good? I mean, maybe this is a bit of a self, uh, <laughs> I've answered this question. Do you think we're good at knowing what to do? Generally, do you think we know? I, I'm going to say I've heard no and a, sh a head shake. I think that is that is that representative of the the audience's opinion here that no, maybe, yeah. So that that's right. We're we're pretty pretty useless at it. So this is taken from a study from the Standish Group. Um, the Standish Group. I occasionally quote their figures on things. They are really really controversial. So. Um, they, they do a lot, a lot of studies, and lots and lots of people question the structure of their studies. So I'm not completely discrediting their studies, because this was done This was done over around 200 projects in what they call business critical systems. Um, no, this is more recent. This is more recent than the chaos study uh, report, yeah. But, the, but yeah, ever, ever, to be honest, it's incredibly hard to officially come up with figures on these things. So, but let's assume a massive error margin here, call it 50% error margin because they're probably wrong. Well, what we still have here is 80% of features delivered in across 200 projects of a two-year period, I think, are hardly ever or infrequently used. Um, uh, and that's still somewhere between, what, 30 and 100% <laughs> with an error margin, assuming, uh, that, uh, that aren't used. So. What I, I would say is, is that no, I, I think that even given a big error margin and knowing that the structure of their research is occasionally debated, um, it's a pretty, a pretty stark judgment on our ability to know what the right thing to do is. If our customers aren't using things, that's a pretty good measure of whether or not we've actually delivered something that's of value to them. So yeah, this is pretty depressing. Um, so I would like to take you through the uh, official Agile Alliance definition of what a product owner is. Um, this is an entertaining section. I didn't expect this section to be as entertaining as it became. So let's read. So this is the official high level, the first paragraph of their description. The product owner is a role on a product development team responsible for managing the product backlog in order to achieve the desired outcome the product development team seeks to accomplish. So I actually quite like this um, for the most part. I like this. So the product development team appear to be setting the outcomes as a team. Sounds pretty good so far, I think. That, that seems nice. Um, you know, generally, it's kind of all right, responsible for managing the product backlog. I'm not completely sure on that, but going by kind of Scrum and Kanban standards, that fits that model. So let's look at this then breaks down. They break down it into some interesting and slightly contradictory uh, uh, things. So, Clearly identify and describe the product backlog items in order to build the shared understanding of the problem and solution with the product development team. Well, so this is, so, so now it seems that the PO is responsible for, they, they identify the problem, then they define the problems, and then they solve the problem, and then they communicate the problem and the solution to the team. Why, why would they bother even telling the team about them? Because they've already solved the problem by this definition, surely. I, 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 these, these product owners seem pretty busy. Uh, they seem to be doing a lot of work. So then we've got um, the next section. Make decisions regarding the priority of product backlog items in order to deliver the maximum outcome with the minimum output. I feel like when, when I say maximum outcome with minimum output, it should be said like a Hollywood, you know, uh, you know kind of like the, the trailer voice, maximum outcome, minimum output or uh, you know, something like the, the Terminator. I, I think that this is a, a really weird thing. So could, does anyone know what max com, maximum outcome and minimum output mean? Out of interest, does anyone want to shoot? So output is the work done, outcome is the value in your view. That's what I understood from it, but I found it quite a vague description. Uh, so they, they, so they say minimum output, yeah. So the work you do is that minimum, minimize the output, maximize the outcome, yeah. It's just saying minimum effort, Yeah, it could, but 
they chose to use strange language. <laughs> So then we, then we have the only bit that almost makes sense, determine whether a product backlog item was satisfactorily delivered. Um, but how? How do you do that? How do you know that something's been delivered satisfactorily? Acceptance criteria, is it just a checklist? Does it work? Yeah, done. The way of measuring it is measuring the outcome. So when you, yeah, so when you're measuring the outcome, exactly, yeah. So, what, what outcomes are typically, could anyone give me an example of what they would describe as an outcome? It's making money. Make money. Okay, so how, <laughs> well, that's an interesting one. If you're in a, a small organization, in a small startup, that can be, that can be very, that feedback loop can be pretty responsive. Um, when you're working in a multinational, how do you know you've definitely made money? Yeah, if you've got actual metrics that you can that you can track. Yeah, absolutely. It's a granular level. It's, it's uh, acceptance criteria. Yeah. But it's, it's open no, I'm just I'm I'm just opening up the <laughs> the conversation. So the, the final ensure transparency into the upcoming work of the product development team. So I find this one odd. So does that mean that the assuming ensure transparency that suggests to me that the product owner knows about the upcoming work and the team don't. Um, I guess, because obviously they're the ones responsible for making that work transparent and, I guess, communicating that work to them. That's what this suggests anyway. Um, what do you, th 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 but then to me that that contradicts the very first description, the high level description that suggests that the product owner is responsible for, um, well, the whole product development team is responsible for setting the goals and obviously the goals are tied into the backlog. That's the, the kind of the manifestation of those goals in theory. Um, so, well, let's keep going. <laughs> so the most important thing that teams need to work on is something that everyone seems to forget. But I'm going to leave you hanging on that, and you can think about that one for, for a little while. Before I, I tell you what the most important thing is, I'd like to talk about this guy. Can anyone tell me who this is? Anyone recognize him? Taylor, yes. Yeah, FW, Frederick Winslow Taylor, there we go. Um, so he is a, a well-known 20th century humanitarian. He's known for the high regard in which he holds his employees. This is a nice little quote from him. The ordinary pig iron handler is not the type of man well suited to shoveling, is too stupid, there is too much mental strain, too much knack required of the shoveler. All right, yeah, so he's not, he's not a humanitarian, um, but he was a scientist. So. The thing with Taylor is that, so Taylor was an industrialist. He worked in uh, turn of the century and he was responsible for pretty much transforming the way that um, industry and manufacturing was done. Um, and what he didn't have and what he lacked in uh, he, the understanding of people, he did have in an understanding of the scientific process. And we actually forget a lot when we talk about Taylor that Taylor was one of the very first people not the first, but very the most popular popularized individual to really popularize the um, empirical method in, in business decision making. So what did he do? So the principle of Taylorism involved using the scientific method to break down every process into its component parts. And then what he would do is measure each part to the hundredth of a minute. Um, and what he would do, so if you imagine you've got a factory, and in that factory you have lots and lots of people, and so in his case it was largely operating around metal work. So this is talking about the pig iron handlers were shoveling pig iron, which was the, the kind of the ore and the kind of dirty iron, the, the dirty um, iron ore into the furnace to then be melted down and to be processed. And there'd be a process of shoveling pig iron into furnace. Or there'd be various people working metal, so working sheets of metal. So what he did was he literally stood there and he just measured everyone. He went round with his, with his stopwatch and he measured. And it, this was known as a, a time and motion study. And he did it for every station. So there could be five or six pig iron handlers and five or six people doing each of the steps. To his horror, he discovered that people did stuff differently. <laughs> they, they did they, they'd have a pig iron handler. It's like, well, for goodness sakes, it, why are you all using different size shovels? These people thought that they considered themselves to be craftspeople, for God's sakes. I mean, these people, I mean, he's already it told us that they're all too stupid for this. You know, they're not craftspeople, they're just people that shovel things. And 
he considered, they all considered themselves to be individuals, they all had different processes, some of them used different tools, they did slightly different things, because they liked the individuality, they liked the individual approach that they took to each of the roles that they had. Um, and he had this, this desire to come up with the one true way of, of each of these processes. There must only be one good way of shoveling pig iron and one good way of working metal. So how did he try to do this? How did he try to come up with the one true way? He came up with a hypothesis. He said, hmm, I wonder if I change the size of this shovel, will it make them shovel a bit quicker? Will they be able to shovel more pig iron per hour? And he had an experiment. Bob, take this shovel, use this please. And Bob says, why the fuck would I want to use this shovel? My shovel's much better. Just, just use it, get on with it. You're too stupid to know the difference between the shovels anyway. And Bob just, you know, got on with it. <laughs> um, and he then gained some learning from that, because lo and behold, Bob actually did do slightly better with this other shovel that he gave him. And he fed that learning into other hypotheses. What's important here is that actually, if the, the first few times when he gave that shovel to, to Jamie and the other people, um, they didn't necessarily shovel any quicker, and he learned that yeah, there's some there was some variation in this, and maybe then he changed it a little bit and found actually I think it was the 20 pound shovel was the the ideal shovel size. There's a there's a whole whole chapter on his book around shoveling. It's not that interesting. Um, <laughs> I've I've saved you the task of reading this. Um, but what he actually did was create a cycle of continuous learning in his organisation. The, the challenge with his continuous learning, and it was continuous learning, was that in his view, unfortunately, continuous learning was pretty much reserved for the upper echelons of the organization. In his view, the only people actually had the mental capacity for that kind of learning, um, which isn't great. So, yes. <laughs> so, what was he missing? <laughs> um, he seemed to be on the right track, and you know what? Actually, he did create a massive, massive improvement in the way that they, you know, he wanted to improve the efficiency of the, and the, you know, the, the certainly the, the revenue capacity and the ability to, to ship metal. And he did improve that hugely, vastly. It pretty much dictated, you know, was pretty much the cutting edge of, of how factories were managed and organized. Well, still in some cases, still today, sadly, but certainly for at least the, the following sort of 50 or 60 years. But what was he missing? So let's jump forward a few decades. And around the same time that Aretha was um, dancing around and singing this song, um, on the other side of the Pacific, there was this guy. Does anyone know who that is? Oh no, yeah, so Taichi Ono. Um, Taichi Ono, um, between 1948 and 1975, so around, uh, uh, around the same time as uh, Aretha, during that smack bang in the middle of that, Aretha was singing. EIG Toyota and him developed the Toyota production system. Who, who's heard of TPS or to, the Toyota production system before? Yeah. So um, this was later referred to a lot of the time. People might, if they haven't heard of TPS, they will probably have heard of lean manufacturing and lean. This led gradually on to, towards the lean movement. Um, he had a very different uh, understanding of time and motion. Um, so yeah, the, the only place that work in motion in, in the same thing are at the zoo when people pay people to see animals move around. That's the only time in, in Tai Chi Ono's thing, which certainly wasn't the factory. So in, in 2001, Toyota wrapped up its whole philosophy and values um, and manufacturing ideals into a thing they called the Toyota Way. And this was 14 principles that were grouped around two key areas. Now, I'm, I'm not gonna go into um, the whole of the Toyota <laughs> production system, um, but I actually recommend anyone interested in, in agile and agile ways of working um, looks up uh, the Toyota Way and Lean Principles. These are very much foundational and highly, heavily inspired all of the agile movement. These came significantly before that, um, but you will see a lot of the core ideas in agile rooted in, in the lean and the manufacturing principles um, created by Ono at, um, at Toyota. Um, so I wanna, before we dive into uh, the Toyota Way, I wanna have a quick look at the little film which is, this is a very short film um, about the, taken, uh, talking about the Toyota Way at a factory in Derby, actually, which is Toyota's factory in Derby. Um, hopefully this will work. Oh, look at that, magic. It's quite overwhelming when you walk through the first time. You've got things flying everywhere, boxes and trucks. 
when you walk through the door and you actually see how big the place is. After you've been here and you realise how everything operates, you can understand why everything's in a certain place, everything has to be in a certain place. My name's Pete Dennis. I started here in May the 11th, 1992. I left mining and I applied for position of team member in the press shop. I got took on as a team leader when we first started here in, in 92. And I can remember walking into the press shop, being in mind the presses I'd worked on were probably maximum up to 50 tonne. We walked into there and they're 3,000 ton presses and they're about as big as a block of flats. So that was a little bit daunting for me. The Toyota production system is the foundation of what Toyota do. Every single member here has the right to stop the line. If he sees something that's not quite right, we have what we call the hand-on system. He has the right to stop that line. Everybody's involved in it. It's not just top-down. We encourage, as we call it, bottom-up. So if a team member comes to me and says, I have an idea for this, you don't ignore him. There's nobody has a better idea than that member. The biggest asset we've got is, is the guys that work here. And it's not because you, know, you, you cut them open and they lock a sticker on and they've got Toyota through it. That's not it, it's just the amount of faith and pride that the people have got. And they will do what they can to help this company because they know it's helping them at the end of the day. I'll just cut it off before we get the big buy Toyota message at the end. Um, so, yeah, so Toyota there, one of the key things that that video shows us is that there are, there are a couple of nice points there when he talks about TPS. One of the interesting things is that, that I, I really like when I look into Toyota is that people often make this differentiation between um, knowledge workers and everyone else. And when they talk about everyone else, they talk about people working in factories most of the time. In their mind, they're thinking, oh, well, because everyone else is doing knowledge work, but everyone, people that aren't doing knowledge work, they're the ones that are basically just doing you know, continuous repetitive things in factories all day long, who have no autonomy, no input on what they do. So yeah, in, in, a, ta in a factory run by Taylor, absolutely true, 100% true. One, an interesting stat from Toyota, one of the things you heard there is the, the point that he made that anyone there um, can come up to him as a manager and say, oh, I've got this idea to change. So in Toyota, they have a suggestion box, and most companies have suggestion boxes, okay? So could anyone guess, out of interest, what the, um, what the typical number of suggestions that you get on an annual basis? So imagine Toyota, I think they have a staff of something like 100,000 across various countries. How many, how many suggestions do you think they might get in a suggestion box on an annual basis? I'm going to say about 10 per employee in a year or something. So in, so in, yeah, in, so in, now that is, uh, so yeah, they do. They get close to a million suggestions on an annual basis. Um, how many of those do you think they implement? About 95% of those suggestions are implemented on an annual basis. Um, and that's because they regard every single individual on the floor, like you said, that individual that came up with the suggestion is the best person to make that suggestion with how to improve it, because they're the ones there doing it. They're the ones that know how to better improve what they're doing. Um, thousands of times. Yeah, 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 thousands of times. And they, um, when it gets, when it gets uh, called too much, people, there's a, a I can never remember the exact context, but there's a conversation that was had where the people are saying, oh, you know, the, the Andon cord, it's being, called, it's being uh, pulled a thousand times less per day than it has been on average. And the, the manager said, well, what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> I expect you to be pulling it far more than that. You must be missing something. So, so the, the two pillars of um, Lean, or the, T, or the Toyota Way, continuous improvement. And we've already seen this. Taylor gave us continuous improvement, OK? Continually observing what's happening, um, hypothesizing on a change, learning from that, experimenting, and then learn, learning from that continuously. Respect for people is perhaps, 
I I'm, don't want to you know don't want to stretch too hard. I think that's probably what Taylor was lacking. I didn't know the man, but I've read a bit about him, and I think that's probably where he where he fell down. So. Um, these are some of the aspects. I'm going to go through the ones that are relevant to, to what I want to talk about. One of the things that um, the Toyota Way talks about is becoming a learning organization with what they call Hansai, which is reflection or Kaizen, and Kaizen, which is good change or continuous change. So what do you think that sounds like? Can anyone think of an agile ceremony that we might occasionally do that talks about reflecting? There we go. OK. So uh, yeah, we copied that from them. Um, so what this is all about is about can they, they literally constantly reflect on their own practices. So they actually have what, um, what if we remember, Taylor was looking for the one true way at, at Toyota. And we'll look at it in a second. They have a thing they call standardized work. Now, standardized work is technically a one true way. They're absolutely standardized on the way that individuals do things. But what's different is that they describe standardized work as the thing that empowers their employees, not you know, punishes them in the way that, that, that um, Taylor's employees felt. What, what that means is, is because they are responsible for defining that standardized work. All of those suggestions, someone says, oh, I think I could make a change to the way that this works. And they go, oh, OK, that sounds like an interesting idea. Let's do an experiment. Oh, yeah, look, how are we going to know that that, that experiment has actually done the improvement you think it's going to be. Oh, well, we'll see that change. OK, let's try that. These are tiny. If you imagine they're doing you know, literally millions of little adjustments all year, these are very small cycles okay, where they very quickly can ascertain, here's an idea for a change, here's a measurement, here's an experiment we can do to see if it worked, and let's get that into our standardized work and very quickly roll that out among uh, individual factories, and then it's rolled out across, across multiple. So they also have a completely open culture. Um, so what that means is, is that it's completely OK for the chap that we saw for any individual to come up and say, I have an idea. No one's going to be shot down. No one's going to be, no one's going to be criticized for coming up with an idea for a change. So the other key thing they do is, is that they build consensus. So this is really, really important, um, is that what that means is, is that when someone has an idea for a change, they say, I've got this idea to make a change. Um, they, or it could be, a lot of the time, it could be a problem has happened. So someone's pulled the and on cord and said, hey, I noticed something's up. Okay, so that, at that point, the whole line stops. Okay? And immediately, the management team, often more than one individual, a lot of people all hover around. Now, remember, the whole line stopped. So actually, anyone can hover up and, and join in this conversation, right? because no one, can, no one can do anything at this point. So they all wander around. They're looking around. They're going straight to the heart of the, the issue. And they'll say, oh, well, you know, so here's the problem. So what do you think the problem really is? They have this conversation around, around identifying what the root of the problem might be. So what are we going to do about this problem? You know, why is there a dint in this door? Where do we think that's coming from? Is that there? Is that up here? Are we going to? They eventually will say, oh, well, what if we did this? That might change. That might improve things. OK, well, how will we know? Well, we won't see the problem anymore. So they go through this cycle. And eventually, all of the people in that group, you'll have a small group of people, they'll build some consensus. And it's very, very important for them. They have this basic idea of take a long time, actually, building consensus. Allow consensus to take time. Allow people to fall into a piece where all of the people think, yeah, this seems like the right direction that we all want to go in. But then once you get there, once they've made that consensus, you implement things quickly. You get on with it. So they then go away, and as a group, will fix the problem, deal with it. And then the line starts again, and they continue after updating the standardized work, so they know not to do that again. And then we talk about standardized work. So as I said, they, they describe, uh, I said before, standardized tasks and processes are the foundation for continuous improvement and employee empowerment, is how they describe it from their, from their book, from the, the officials. So let's imagine a scene. An employee is on the factory floor. And he's pulled the and on cord. Oh, oh, there's a defect there. Oh, oh, oh look at that. That was beautiful. And, um, and at this point, a manager's going to walk down and discuss that the animation's kind of, uh, he's meant to walk, but he's, he's a little glidey. Um, he was a bit stiff. <laughs> um, the, uh, and, you know, he's saying, what's going on? And this person says, oh, there's a dint in this box that we're building. There's a problem with this thing. And um, 
the manager at that point is, is going to then challenge this individual to actually work out what the problem really is. Because a lot of the time, it's saying, oh, there's, a, there's a dint in the door. It's obviously this. This is clearly the problem. But maybe it's not. It might not be. A lot of the time, the problem isn't the most obvious problem. And that's something the manager is able to do. Because a manager will have, generally, a bigger picture understanding of the problem than the individual. Another key thing in, in Toyota is that managers almost exclusively have been promoted from the floor. Okay, they've been, they work their way up through the organization. Not all the time, but almost exclusively across the organization. So actually, while they might not have recent experience of what this station, how this station operates and what the details are, um, they do have some experience. They do have some knowledge. Um, and then at that point, they're all going to go over here because they've decided it is this station after much conversation. And they're then going to... I know ask what's, you know what's causing the problem. They're going to end up into another dialogue now between all of these people now. So this person's at the station. They're all saying, so what's going on? Um, they they realise that the um, you know that the dint is obviously happening here. They've identified the issue. They then build some consensus around what's happening, and they're able to uh, they're able to fix. You know, once they have that consensus, they're able to then. Um, they're able to then fix the problem, update the sandalized work, and they continue. So one of the interesting things, this is a chap called Jim Womack. He is largely known for popularizing kind of lean manufacturing in the States um, for the most part. And he's decided that, that this problem-solving process is, is entirely the highest form of respect. Now, one thing that I find interesting with the problem-solving process, a lot of people, certainly from Western cultures, tend to look at that conversation, especially the point at which the manager challenges the employee and says, are you really sure that's the problem? Are you really, it could be something else. They say, oh, why are they patronizing? The manager doesn't really know. You know why? Well, a lot of the time, well, firstly, in Toyota, a lot of the time the managers do have more knowledge than perhaps some of the managers over here do. Um, but actually, it comes down to these two key things about mutual respect. A manager says to the individual, I respect your close-up knowledge, ability, and dedication to solve this problem. And the team say, or the team members say, I respect your big picture perspective that allows you to ask me the tough questions that get me closer to the solution. And that's really important. That dialogue is absolutely critical to the way that we problem solve. That, that is collaboration. And it only happens when you have that, that mutual respect. So you have to solve problems together. If you're not solving problems collaboratively, then you're missing out on one of the greatest strengths that, you're, um, that, you, you know, that, that you get from using an agile process. So I mentioned an agile superpower. <laughs> Does anyone know what the superpower is? <coughs> I almost said it, actually, by accident a second ago. Does anyone know? It begins with C. It's really obvious, but we often forget it. So yes. Um, collaboration. It's not the biggest surprise, but it's actually something that we forget frequently when we're dealing with, when we're working. The majority of teams aren't actively collaborating at all. A quick question, how many people in this room's teams pair all the time? So pairing, by the way, it doesn't count if you're just occasionally sitting next to each other solving a problem. It might intermittently be pairing, but it's not actually pairing if you're not actively collaborating. Any mobbers, mobbing going on? I guess not. Oh, mobbing, yay! <laughs> Are you, do you work at GDS? Skybet. Oh, well, like, yeah, I know Skybet do mobbing. <laughs> Sorry, Ed. <laughs> so, yeah, the, uh, yes. So, there are a few mobbers. Great, awesome. But, the, but generally, the majority of people here as teams are actually still working individually most of the time. Um, and what that actually means is, is that you work individually, you do some individual work, and I'm guessing you have a daily stand up where you synchronize. That's not actually collaborating. That's just giving an update. Whether you're giving an update, even in a very good stand-up, where you're giving an update genuinely to the whole team, as opposed to giving an update to a manager, which occasionally stand-ups can be, um, it's not actually collaboration if you're not working together. <laughs> you have to actually do the work together. That's, that's collaboration. So let's tie this together. How do we... Oh, I wonder how we do this, this collaboration. So how, for example, does the product owner collaborate with the team, genuinely? So start by bringing a hypothesis to your team, an idea that might solve the problem or bring you closer to the goal. Obviously, that 
infer strongly that that goal needs to be well understood and communicated. That's another nine hours of talks. <laughs> um, the team's job is then to come up with an experiment. I like to ask the team to try to disprove the, the, the hypothesis that I come up with. Here is a hypothesis. I think this is going to be an awesome idea. Please show me that it's not going to be an awesome idea. Um, I like to do that because it totally and utterly devalues me and any worry that they might have in questioning me as a PO in that particular context. Um, any kind of additional value that I might add just by the position that I might be in. Because it's important that you do that, because that's going to bias the way that they approach and they report to you, because they will want it to work, even if maybe it doesn't. Um, so you ask them to disprove it, and you ask them to disprove it as quickly as they possibly can. What's the quickest route that you can come up with to show me that this idea doesn't work? Okay. They then learn from that. You know what? They may well not be able to prove that it doesn't work. That's awesome. Okay. It's also awesome if they prove very quickly that it doesn't work. It is just as important, just as important, even more important, to mark out all of the paths that you don't want to take as it is to find the one that you need to take. Every single time that you knock down a potential, a potential possible solution that isn't the good idea and you do that quickly, you've saved yourselves hours of pain. And then you learn. And you know what? Each time you go around this cycle as a team, you learn about the product and the problem that you're trying to solve and you build consensus. <laughs> and in science, someone produces a theory, and that theory is presented on a paper and published in a journal, and ideally it's peer-reviewed. And over time, other scientists may well test the theory with experiments. And gradually, you're going to end up with consensus building. You have a set of, um, you gradually have a set of, of um, Experiment, experimental, experimental outputs that will prove or gradually disprove or build an idea around a theory, okay, that give that theory weight that people begin to then respect and understand. Um, this is no different from the way that knowledge can build as a, as a whole team, as an entire product team. So as a whole product team, um, as a PO, you may well be a business domain expert. I was recently working with a company that developed a pension product, okay? So the PO happened to be an ex-trader that worked and managed pension funds, so had deep knowledge of how those calculations were formed, how to calculate the values of pensions, etc., etc. something I know nothing about. And interestingly, something most of the team that, that he was working with knew nothing about in detail. But they, while he could bring that input and he could present those ideas and he could say, you know, here is, uh, this is what I think is a good idea. He didn't have the whole solution. He said, based on my experience, I think this is a feature that would be valuable at this particular time. And a team would then work together to prove him wrong. <laughs> and they did that using the quickest route. So, with that inspiration in mind, I have uh, my own pillars of collaborative product ownership. So the first one, unsurprisingly, respect people. Don't... Um, <coughs> Don't bring your team solutions. I a typo. Don't bring your team solutions to implement. Show the team you respect their ability to solve the problems that you bring them. Don't bring them solutions. Don't tell them this is going to solve all your problems. Bring them a problem. You know, let them solve the problem. Um, you probably, if you bring them a solution and you've not used the whole team to come up with that solution because you've solved it on your own, um, well, that's a bit of a waste, really. I mean, you've got all of these smart people on your team. Use them. Embrace uncertainty. Nothing is more damaging to our organization than fake certainty. We need to accept the inherent uncertainty that reality presents, or the complex adaptive systems that we often are living in, and not pretend we have certainty when it doesn't exist. Small experiments. Work with your team to overcome uncertainty by collaborating on small experiments that gradually build shared understanding of the problem space throughout the team. And with every experiment comes learning. Even if they invalidate your theory, learning will always move you towards your goal, even when it seems like you haven't. It's Thomas Jefferson that said that I didn't fail to invent the light bulb. I just found 10,000 ways that didn't work. Well, that was very important in his quite long journey to inventing the light bulb, eventually. Allow consensus to build naturally across the team, but ensure it's safe to question anything, even things that seem so certain 
especially the things that seem certain, don't get complacent. So this is going back to uh, Ian's talk at the beginning. The things that are obvious, that's that cliff, okay? The cliff in the obvious section in the Kinefin, that's the something that seems so obvious, but oh shit, it's not, and I've just fallen off a cliff, and now we're in chaos. That's what happens when you are complacent with the situations that you find yourselves in. So product owners can respect the people on the team by collaborating with them on solving problems and embrace the uncertainty of reality. Teams can overcome uncertainty by using small experiments to test the hypothesis which leads to continuous learning and builds consensus on the validity or invalidity of a theory. But no team should ever be complacent with the present state of understanding and it should always be safe to question anything, however certain it may seem. So, where does this leave us? Could I ask the product owners to stand up again, please? Sorry, I know it's the end of the evening, it's late, I try to tear through this as quickly as I can. So, one of the wonderful things that becoming a truly collaborative product development team brings you, where as a product owner, you become a team member, okay? You are working with the team and have shared accountability with the team for delivering the product and for deciding on the direction of the product by utilizing everyone. There's a wonderful thing that comes out of that. Could I ask you all to remove your <laughs> stickers, please? Welcome to the team. Thank you very much. <laughs> um,